Captain Kelly, it's Scott Pelly. Hi, Scott. Every time I hear your name on 60 Minutes, I turn around and it sounds like someone's calling my name. I, to be honest with you, I have to tell you how many people have stopped me on the street astonished to see me because they heard on the radio that Scott Pelley was going to the space station. That's pretty funny. I kid you not. I think some people in the audience would prefer uh, that I be up there, too. I would gladly trade a consonant to uh, switch places with you. Well, we enjoy watching 60 Minutes up here, so I guess if you were here with us, we could do some, uh, you could do it live. Absolutely. We'd be proud to do it. Let's talk about the medical mission for just a moment. A round-trip mission to Mars would take a year and a half or so. What are some of the big unanswered questions about human endurance? Uh, the big one we have right now is this issue with our, our vision and, uh, you know, how astronauts, some astronauts on long-duration space flights have had a, uh, you know, degradation in their vision that is concerning. You, you wouldn't want, you know, some as astronauts to get on Mars after a year and a half or, you know, longer or when they're coming home and not be able to see. Uh, it's something we don't understand, but it's something we're working uh, hard at understanding and mitigating the effects. We've done a lot of research up here since I've been here to better understand that. Um, and then there's the more commonly uh, discussed issues of bone loss and muscle loss uh, that we, you know, have a pretty good handle on and understand how to mitigate those through exercise and diet. Um, and then there's the effects of radiation. And, uh, you know, the study we're doing with my brother uh, is, uh, you know, partially looking into that and how that affects us and the, the environment here on a genetic scale. You and your brother are the only siblings to have flown in space, and I wonder what does having identical twins get you in these experiments that you're doing? Well, you know, we are very, uh, very similar genetically. Um, not, you know, 100% the same, but 99.9% .9 or something close to that, uh, similar or identical with regards to our, our DNA, or RNA, you know, and proteins. Now, those things manifest themselves differently in, in individuals based on, you know, various factors, including their environment. You know, the two of us are as close as you can get with uh, people that have flown in space. And, you know, there are a lot of factors here that can affect us on a genetic scale, for instance, with the radiation or, you know, even the microgravity environment. So having my brother as a control subject, you know, someone that NASA has studied for a long time, knows knows him very well, have uh, has samples, um, you know, for him from from decades ago it's a uh, you know a perfect opportunity to see how we change on a genetic basis over the course of the year i'm going to be here now i know the answer to this question but tell the folks at home why you have your arms crossed in front of you Well, um, it's interesting. You know, it's kind of awkward. The position you, you've, your, your natural, like, floating position, it's, I don't know, it, it's sort of comfortable, but it's awkward to have your arms out like this, I think. Um, it's also a little chilly in here. Uh, so it's kind of a combination of the two. I would put my hands in my pockets, but then people tell me, hey, you, it's kinda, you, why are you putting your hands in your pockets all the time? And if you move your arms around too much, you start to float around. Isn't that right? You start to uh, generate some momentum. I, I guess you, you, you could maybe a little bit, but you really the major, the major reason is for me is that this is not comfortable. I mean, it, it's somewhat comfortable, but it's also awkward to be floating around like this all the time. So I tend to cross my arms. This is your fourth 
mission in space. You've been the commander of the space station before. The first element of the station was launched in 1998. How's it holding up? So I was here in uh, in 2007 uh, as a shuttle crew member, and then in 2010 I launched in October, came home in 2011. So it was about four years uh, gap between the time I lived here for six months and now. And I was surprised at how uh, similar it looked. Um, you know, it really didn't look like it had aged much at all. Uh, the systems are still operating very well. Uh, of course, as, as things get older, you, you gen generally will have more problems, and we expect that, but we plan for it. But the, you know, the space station is in pretty good shape, and uh, you know, I think we can fly it for a long time and do a lot of, a lot of great research here. We're going to have 400 experiments running while I'm here for this year, and uh, you know, we look forward to some great results. You know, there are a lot of things you can't tell from television. What, what does it sound like in there? What does it smell like in there? Does it smell like a gem? You know, it, the, the smell is a combination of, you know, and it smells differently in different places, but, you know, occasionally like an antiseptic uh, smell combined with, like, garbage, <laughs> you know, um, but it doesn't really smell bad, but it does have a unique smell. Now, space has its own unique smell. So whenever a vehicle docks um, or, you know, if guys are out doing a spacewalk, the smell of space when you open up the, uh, the hatch is very uh, distinct. It's kind of like a burnt, uh, like a burning metal smell, if you could imagine what that would smell like. And as far as the sounds on the space station, it's... Uh, you know, it's pumps, fans, motors. Certain modules are louder than others, um, but it's uh, you know it's generally a pretty nice working environment. It's not uh, you know it's not too loud or too smelly. Now you're going to be up there about a year, and I wonder, does that feel like a year in jail? Um, you know, there are probably some similarities, I would, I would suspect, you know, you can't leave, uh, you know, no matter what happens, you're not, you're not going home. Um, you know, we don't get to go outside, so that's a little bit different. I, I would imagine in a lot of jails, people get fresh air, so you don't, you don't get that here. Uh, and you don't get real sunlight, you know, there's a little sun coming through the windows, but... Uh, so, you know, it's in some ways, I guess it's similar. In some ways, it's uh, uh, different. The big difference, though, is here we're here, but here by choice. So that makes, I guess, the uh, situation feel a little bit uh, better. But in all serious, but in all seriousness, what are the psychological effects of being confined in that space for all that time? Yeah, so I've been up here, you know, almost 90 days, and uh, I got, you know, about 250 to go or something like that. Uh, and, yeah, it seems like I've been up here for a long time already. Um, but the psychological effects are one of the reasons we're doing this, is to better understand that. Now, I think at least where I am at this point, I'm not going to have any major issues with it, but I'm very conscious of the fact that I have to manage my fatigue level and, you know, rest when I have time to rest and exercise and, you know, do all those things that, that can, you know, just help me get to the end of this with the amount of energy and, uh, you know, attention to detail and enthusiasm I have at the beginning. But certainly, you know, that's one of the reasons we're doing this. If we're going to go further from Earth, you know, to Mars or somewhere else someday, we have to, you know, have a, a good understanding of the psychological impact on people. And not only, you know, psychologically, but how it affects their cognition. You know, we're doing a lot of research on my cognitive abilities. And, you know, some of those tests I'm doing will compare it to my brother over the course of this year. Although my cognition, I think, is generally better than his in general. But we're still, you know, he's the closest um, 
comparison we have. But, yeah, all those factors are, are one of the reasons why we're doing this. Scott Kelly, about 200 miles up, traveling at 17,000 miles an hour. We're grateful for your time. Thank you. My pleasure. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes the event.